All right, continuing our study in the book of Hebrews. We're in the, uh, the third chapter. Uh, last time we left off, we'd been talking about a number of similarities between Christ and Moses and how that Moses was a type of Christ. And I think we gave at least 15 different similarities that Brother Kaufman had mentioned in his commentary. Uh, but there's another thing that I wanted to mention about that, and that is that Moses was also uh, an apostle and a priest, uh, at least in a sense. Uh, uh, we talked about apostle. What is an apostle? What does the word apostle mean? One sent on a mission. And we talked about emphasize too, one sent on a mission in which they're given authority uh, to carry out that mission. Well, Moses was sent on a mission by God. Uh, he was sent by God down to Egypt to free uh, Israel from the Egyptian bondage and to deliver them into the land that God had promised all the way back to the times of Abraham and to Isaac and Jacob, uh, the land that he had promised them. And Moses did that. And so there's that sense in which Moses was an apostle, not an apostle now as we think about those apostles that served Christ, but they were, he was an apostle in that he was sent on a mission by God. He was authorized by God that was proven by the miracles that he was given to do, that would prove who he was to the people, that he was sent by God. And so he was, in that sense, an apostle. But now when you think about Moses as being a priest, uh, we realize it's his brother Aaron who uh, became the first high priest that God had for his people, uh, and he's the one that's given that title. But when we think about a priest, what, what's the responsibility of a priest? What does he do? To intercede for the people. Now, question, did Moses ever intercede for the people of God? Yes, a number of times. There were times when God uh, was so angry at Israel because of the fact that they had not been obedient to Him, were not doing what they were supposed to do. You know, that God had thought about destroying them, every one of them, and, and telling Moses, I'll begin with you. But Moses would intercede on their behalf to God and plead with God not to destroy them, that these were his people, and, and encouraging God, simply remember those promises you made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all, and, and not destroy this great nation uh, of yours. And so he interceded on behalf of the people. So in that sense, he served like a priest. He made intercession for the people, and he did that on a number of occasions. So he was like uh, Christ in that sense, like being an apostle and a priest. But... Basically, Moses is described for us as a servant of God. Uh, in the book of Numbers, chapter 12, and verse 7, uh, it, it talks about this. God, it says, Not so with my servant Moses. And so God speaks of Moses as being his servant. And, and Moses was a servant. He was a great servant uh, that, that served God. He was a great man. Uh, I've got to myself there. He, he was a great man in service to God, as a servant in God's house. Think about some of the things that, that Moses did. Uh, again, when we think about Moses and the success, success he had, uh, Moses is the one to whom God gave the uh, uh, plans for the tabernacle. And uh, what did he tell Moses to do? See that you what? See that you build it according to the model that I showed you in the mountain. And so now, he is a servant of God to do what God tells him to do. And not only that, but later he's going to be talked about here as being a faithful servant of God. And so we'll say more about that later. But that's important for us to keep this in mind as to who he is. He was a man who was faithful to God in all of God's house. And, but still, he was simply a servant of God in God's house. Now, being a servant of God's in God's house, Jesus is more than that because Jesus was the builder of the house. Uh, he was more than just someone who was in the house. He's the one that built the house. Now, a house, any house that, that, that's built, you know, it, people may look at that house and think, boy, now this is a beautiful house that's been built. And it may be a, a lot of things about that house that would appeal to a person that we like about it. But you've got to realize the person that builds that house is due greater honor than the house itself. And so Christ was the builder of his house. Uh, we'll talk more about this in a little bit, but just for the time being, what was the house that Christ built? The church. 
and all of us are part of that house. We're members of the church, and so uh, he, he built us in, into that house uh, for God. So he is the builder of the house. He's deserving of greater honor than uh, the one who did. Now, when the writer talks about this in verse 4, what he is saying, I believe, is really instrumental in, in providing evidence, our ways of reasoning evidence, so that we can know uh, that Christ is of God. And we can know that God is a real being and not just something people suppose. Uh, again, look at that verse there in chapter 3 at verse 4. He makes the statement, he says, For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now, this is the beginning of an argument for the existence of God that is sometimes called the cosmological argument. Don't worry about that word. That's just the title that's given to it, cosmological. But it's an argument based upon contingency. And that is, how, how can you explain the existence of anything? For example, you know, if you think about myself, how, how can you account for my being here? How can you account for my existence? And well, you know, I'd say, well, that goes back to my parents. You know, I'm the result of their sexual union together uh, that I was conceived and born. But So my existence was contingent upon my parents' existence. But how do you account for their existence? Well, then you've got to go back to their parents. Well, what about my grandparents? Well, you've got to go back to their parents. And on and on and on, until eventually you have to come to a being that's responsible for the existence, and yet who himself is not contingent. His existence is not dependent upon anybody else. And we understand that to be God. And I believe that basically that's what... The writer of Hebrews is talking about here when he says, Every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. So just stop and think for a moment about this building we're sitting in here. Uh, if you think about this building, I think two things become obviously clear we can say about this building. Number one, we know this building is not eternal. It hasn't always existed. I don't know, there may be some members uh, here in this church that maybe can remember back when this building was built. Uh, maybe there are pictures somewhere uh, of this lot uh, when the land was purchased and, and people were thinking about building a building here. And, and so there's evidence to let people know, hey, this building has not been here forever. And, and secondly, we can know that this building didn't just happen. It didn't just spring up. It didn't happen because the tornado went through and a bunch of material got whisked together and it formed this building. We know that's not the case. We understand that every building is built some by, by somebody. So we know this house, this building here, was established by somebody. Somebody got together with plans, and working together, they built this building. And so that's what the writer's saying. Every house is built by someone. We understand that. We don't have any problems realizing that. But then he says, but the builder of all things is God. So how do you explain this earth on which we're living? How do you explain this solar system of which we're a part? Or how do you explain the galaxy uh, that we're a part of, the Mil Milky Way? H how do you explain all of the galaxies that exist? How do you explain everything? Well, you have to get back to that being that's contingent, non-contingent, that being that established everything and yet who himself was not established. And that has to be God. God is the one who built all things. And that's the conclusion he comes to. The builder of every house, every house is built by somebody, but the builder of all things is God. And so here's a way of establishing the existence of God, evidence for God's existence. The very world in which we're living, everything about us is contingent upon God's being here forever and ever. He is the being that has existed for eternity. He is an eternal being. There was no beginning for God. He has always been here. And so He is the builder of all things. And so we understand that. God is the builder of, every, of everything. Now, He says, Moses, regarding Him, Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant. Now, when we think about this, this idea, uh, wait, wait, here we go. Uh, he says, And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant. Uh, he wasn't just a servant. He was a great servant. And the greatness of Moses is seen, in fact, 
that, number one, he's described as being a faithful servant. Now, what does that mean to be a faithful servant? What, what kind of a servant is a faithful servant? Yeah, he's the one that's going to obey. He's going to listen to the one that's over him. And, and Moses is a faithful servant in his house, that is, in God's house. And Moses was faithful to everything that God told him. When God told him to build that tabernacle according to the model that I showed you in the mountain, Moses didn't look at that model and say, well, you know, Lord, I think, I think I see where we need to make a few changes in that and what we need to do. He never suggested that. And when he built that tabernacle, had it built, he had it built according to what God said. He was faithful to God to do exactly what God said in building it. And he also was a faithful servant who delivered God's law, uh, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. Uh, that's the law of God that was given through Moses. And again, Moses didn't take that uh, away from God and look at that and say, you know, well, here's some things I don't like about this. I think I'm just going to scratch out this law and not include that in it. And here's some other things I don't like. And I, by the way, I can think of some things I think need to be included. And I'll write that. He didn't do that. He was faithful as a servant of God, and so the law that God gave him, Moses faithfully delivered that law exactly as God gave it to the Israelite people. God gave that law to Moses, and Moses gave the exact law to the people. He's faithful to God as a servant of God. And so that lets us know that Moses is a great man, and that's one of the things that makes him great, is the fact that he was simply faithful to God in doing exactly what God told him to do, in living in keeping with God's will and all these things. So he was faithful to God in everything as a servant. Now, we come to Christ. Verse 6 says, But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. So compare Moses, a great servant, but compare him to Moses, and it becomes clear that, that Christ is far greater because Moses is identified as a servant. But how does God identify Jesus? He's a son. And, and, and a son is greater than the servant in that house. The son is... Well, what makes Christ greater? Uh, well, the Bible talks about Christ is superior because he is the son over his house. Moses is a servant in the house of God, but Jesus is the son of God over his house. Now, what does it mean to be over the house? Now, you're in charge of everything. You're responsible for it. You are the ruler. You're the head of that house that you give. And so that is the way it is here with Christ. Uh, he is superior because he is not just the son uh, in the house. He's the son over the house. Uh, one of the passages we want to look at here. 1 Timothy 6, 13 to 15. The Apostle Paul says, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless, until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, I think we understand most of that. What, what does it mean that Jesus is King of kings? He's above all of them. He's the superlative king. Uh, in the Old Testament, one of the books that we have is uh, the Song of Solomon, but in the Hebrew it's called the Song of Songs, which means this is a song superior to all the other songs. You know, and when people talk in that term, that, that's what we're emphasizing, superiority of it. And so when Jesus is King of Kings, he's superior to all other kings. He is the King who rules over all other kings. It doesn't matter how some earthly king, how much, much power he might have, uh, we recognize the fact he's under the power of Christ. Christ is the King of Kings. The same way, the Lord of Lords. He's the superior Lord of all other lords that have ever lived or ever will live. He's over all of them. But what about that designation, potentate? What, what is a potentate? You have to look that word up like I did. <laughs> He's described here as the potentate. All right, let me, let me uh, read here about this. Uh, 
The dictionary defines this word as one of great power. Now, the Greek word is dunatest, and it's from the same Greek word dunamos, which is translated as power. Uh, it's the word, as we talked about before, from which we get our word dynamite. So Christ is one of power. Uh, someone turn over to the book of Acts, chapter 8, for just a moment, and uh, I believe it's verse 27. Acts chapter 8 and verse 27. A man in charge of all her treasure. It's the same word that's being used here, the potentate. It's the same word in the Greek. It's someone who has authority over all her treasury. Well, does that mean that, that, that Christ is just one of many potentates? No, the text says Christ is the only potentate. He is the only one with this supreme power and authority. All authority, Jesus said, has been given to him on heaven and earth. So he is the only potentate. He is the ruler of it. So Christ is the one being head over the house means he is the one who rules over the house. He rules over the church. Christ is the head of the church. And so he's the one that, that directs the church into what we're to do. He is one over us and authority over us. Uh, and we Christians are that house. Uh, one other passage from that, 1 Timothy 3.15. But if I am delayed, Paul says, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So the church is the house of God. And so Christ is son over the house. He's over the church. And so that makes him superior to Moses. As great as Moses was, and there's no doubt he was a great servant of God, he was still a servant. But Christ is greater than that because he is not a servant, but he's the son. And he's not just in the house, he's over the house. He is the ruler in control of all of that. And so again, the Hebrew writer here is emphasizing the superiority of Jesus in all of this. And we need to understand he's superior to Moses. And these people he's writing to are, are Jewish people who become Christians, and yet many believe that they're on the verge of leaving and going back to the old religion they had, of worshiping God under that old law. And so the Hebrew writer is trying to remind them of the superiority of Christ. And that man that you honor so much, Moses, you need to understand Christ is superior to him. And the kingdom that he has given to us is superior to what Moses knew anything about. And so uh, he is not just a part of that house, but he is the one who's the ruler of the house. Now, all of us are part of the house it has, but our continuing as a part of that house is conditional. Notice again what the writer says in regard to that here. Uh, he talks about how that uh, if we hold fast, we're part of the house, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. We're all part of God's house, but to remain a part of this house, we've got to remain, you know, confirm to Him. We've got to keep ourselves in the right conduct in obedience to God uh, and hold on to that hope that we have. Because the Hebrew writer recognizes the possibility, and he'll talk more about this later in, in chapter 6, but he realizes there's a possibility that any one of us could lose that hope we have. Uh, it has happened to other people. It's possible that we could lose that relationship with Christ. And, and if we do, then we can't continue as a part of His house, the church. We can't continue as a part of His kingdom. And so that basically does away with the false doctrine that so many people believe in, once saved, always saved. If we're going to continue in the right relationship with God and be a part of His house... We've got to hold fast to that confidence uh, and that we have. And some said, you know, go on to rejoice in the hope firm to the end. We've got to hold on to that, to do that. 
Uh, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. I think you put that up here. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer, Jesus said. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. And so the promise that God's making to give to us a crown of life is not an absolute promise. It's a conditional promise. Now, whether or not we have that crown of life is conditioned upon whether or not we're faithful to God unto death. And that's basically what the Hebrew writer is talking about here. We've got to hold fast to that confidence and to that uh, hope that we have in Him. And we've got to do that, hold firm to that, to the end. Now, what end is he talking about? You need to hold on to that hope to the end. What end? Well, it, it could be a variety of things that might be involved in that. Uh, Brother Burton Kaufman uh, suggested uh, about four different things about that that, that that it could have reference to. Number one, it could be talking about the end of uh, a period where, where you are being tested, uh, where you're under uh, uh, stress because of uh, the temptations that are coming your way. And you need to hold on. I've got to hold on to that hope that I have in Christ. I've got to hold on to till that temptation is gone. But it could also refer to what? The end of life. You know, you hold on to that hope to the end of life. You don't give up on that, no matter what happens. Uh, you know, so keep that in mind. It could be to the end of the world. You know, don't give up on that. You've got to hold on to that hope in God. And that's extremely important because there's a possibility you might lose it. We've talked about before Luke 24, the two men walking on the road to Emmaus. And when Jesus joins them and, and, and he asks why their countenance has fallen, why they are sad, and, and they are shocked that he doesn't understand what's happened in Jerusalem. And when he says what things, they explain to him about how that Jesus had been crucified. And they say this is the third day since that happened. And then they added this statement. They said, and we had hope that it was He that would deliver Israel. But you notice that we had hope. It's past tense. Which indicates they don't have that hope anymore because Jesus is now dead. And they don't understand that. Even though He had talked about it, He had told His disciples that He was going to die, uh, they didn't understand it. When He died, for many of them, that meant their hope died. They didn't have that hope anymore. We've got to realize we need to hold on to that hope and not give up on it. Uh, so Christ is superior to Moses in every way, and, and, and we're part of that house that he has built over which Christ is head. But we've got to hold on to that and not let go. Uh, remember this letter was written to Christians who are in danger of losing their hope. And that's why he's giving this encouragement to them. That's why he talks about this, about holding fast. And we're going to see this again and again. And we're going to see again and again when he talks about this idea uh, of conditional deal. Uh, it's if you do such and such, that these blessings will be yours. So we've got to do that. So he goes on to continue now talking about Christ's rest is superior to that of Moses and Joshua. What kind of rest did Moses give the people? We'll talk more about this again later, but what was the rest that they had under Moses' law? The Sabbath day. When they were in Egypt, how many days did they have off? None. You know, they had to work every day. And so when God freed them and brought them out of captivity, and He established His law with them, He talks about it there in the book of Deuteronomy, and He says that God made a covenant with us, all, even all of us who are alive here this day. He didn't make this covenant, they said, to our fathers. He made it here with us. And in that covenant that God made, He gave them the Sabbath day as a day of rest. And by the way, that's what the word Sabbath means. It doesn't mean seventh. It means rest ceasing from labor. And so they're given a day of rest. That's the rest that, that Moses gave to them. But what kind of rest did Joshua give to them? Think about it now. Something they, they didn't have under or Moses, but they did have under Joshua. They had rest in that promised land. And we'll notice this a little bit later. We're going to look at the different verses that talk about all these things. Though Moses brought them out of Egyptian bondage, 
they never got to the promised land. Initially, when they got there, they refused to go in because they were afraid of the report that had been given. And so they rebelled against God. So they spent the next 40 years wandering in the wilderness till all of that generation had died. So they didn't get to know the rest in that promised land. But under Joshua, they did get it. Now, what's going to happen is that even after they have that rest in that land, the statement is made there is still a rest for the children of God. And so the rest that was given to them by Moses, a Sabbath day, the rest that was given to them by Joshua, a rest in that promised land uh, that God had given to them, is inferior to the rest that Jesus is going to give to them, that he gives to all of us. And so that, that's all going to be taken up from chapter 3, verse 7, through chapter 4 and verse 13. Uh, but just by way of introduction to this, I just want to look at these first few verses, verses 7 through 11. The Hebrew writer says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, They shall not enter my rest. Now, they had the rest of the Sabbath day that had been given to them. But they didn't have that rest in the promised land. And God swore they're not going to enter that. And so that generation didn't enter that promised land. Uh, they spent 40 years wandering the wilderness until all of them had died. They were not going to be able to have that. Now, what, what's happening here in this passage is that the Holy Spirit is warning these readers of what happened to the Jews in the wilderness. Now, it's a warning that he gives so that, you know, they can recognize, listen, Though that land had been promised to them by God, they never got to enjoy it. Why? It's because of their disobedience. They wouldn't listen to God and do what God told them to do. Now, we have a promise uh, of a land of rest that He's made to us. But like I said, it's not absolute. It's a conditional thing. And it's conditioned upon our being faithful to God in our lives. And, and so that's what the Holy Spirit's doing. Uh, He's quoting here from the book of Psalms, chapter 95, verses 7 through 11. The first six verses of that psalm uh, deals with worship. Uh, and, and worship's important. And we need to know about worshiping God and how to worship God. We need to worship Him as He's told us. But as important as worship is, uh, that worship is not going to avail anything. It's not going to be acceptable to God unless it comes from honest and obedient hearts. People who will listen to God and obey Him to do what He says. Then our worship can be and will be acceptable to God. Uh, one other verse I wanted to notice here is in the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, I'm going to turn over just a few moments here. Ephesians, not Ephesians, Ecclesiastes, and we'll look at uh, chapter 5 and particularly verse 1. Someone read that for us. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 1. Darnell, please. Okay. Guard yourselves when you come to worship God. Uh, because, you know, you, you've got to be careful lest what you do in worshiping God is not that which is acceptable to God, but in God's sight it becomes evil. And so worship is important, but we've got to make sure that our worship of God is in obedient to God's will. Uh, and if we do that with an honest and open heart. But these people have not been doing that. And so what Paul does here, and there I go again, Paul, I believe he wrote Hebrews, uh, but the writer of Hebrews, and he goes, you know, what he's trying to do here uh, is to show that disobedience to the people that kept them from being able to enjoy that land that God had promised. Uh, and this goes back to the book of Exodus, chapter 17, and, and verse 2, uh, where the Jews had, on that occasion, complained about not having water. Uh, you know, and they said, you brought us out here in this wilderness just to die, you know, and, and there were those who over and over again would complain about the things that they had and talk about, you know, it would have been better for us if we had died in Egypt or let's go back to Egypt where we 
we sat by, you know, uh, in the evening and ate all that food that we had and began thinking about that. And they're complaining about what their situation is and what God has done for them. And so when Moses writes about this, he refers to that place and calls it Massa, which means to test or to prove, and Meribah, which means quarreling or dissension. Because this was a time when the people began testing God and began complaining and quarreling against God for what He had done to them. And that's not the only time that's happened. Over and over again, they did that. Uh, Numbers chapter 14 and verse 20. This is important. We need to have somebody read it. Numbers chapter 14 and verse 20. If you got that, raise your hand. All right, Saul, please. Okay, read, read, I'm sorry, I said 20, 20 through about 22. Okay. God says through Moses here, You've tested me ten times. You've put God to the test. Every time that they complained about something they didn't have and complained that God's brought them out here in the wilderness to die, uh, ten times they've been doing that. And so, you know, this is not, that's why I say this is not the first time that they've done that, but it's because of this. This is why God, you know, punished Israel. This is why they didn't get to enjoy the rest in that promised land. Because of their disobedience to God, they wouldn't listen to what God said. And, and because of their continued rebellion, uh, God swore that they would not enter into His rest. It's not very many times in the Bible you find God swearing about something. But here's one of those times. God swore that they would not enter into His rest. And so that meant there was no chance that they were going to get to go into that land. Uh, because they're not listening to God, they're not obedient to God to do what God wants them to do. Now, it's interesting here, when, when you notice about that, what, what he says about it, uh, it talks about how that these people uh, have strayed from God in their hearts. Uh, before the time ever came that they were disobedient to God and, and failing to do what God wanted to do, they had strayed from God already in their hearts. Uh, verse 10 of chapter 3. Therefore I was provoked with that generation and said, They always go astray in their hearts. They have not known my ways. So before the time came that they actually disobeyed God, they had already strayed in their hearts. They had already gone away from God, not going to listen to what God had to say. Now you stop and think in, in, in regard to that about what, Solomon said in the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, and verse 23, when he said, Keep your hearts with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. That's why it's so important that we, we keep our hearts clean and pure, uh, that we have that attitude always in our life, that though I may be weak and I may fail, my desire is to obey God and to do what God wants me to do. Uh, because look at Israel. And they're straying away from God. But he says they always stray in their hearts. So before they actually committed sin against God by outward disobedience, it began in their hearts when they'd strayed away from God. They'd already made that decision. And so we've got to realize, we, we've got to persevere, we've got to continue on in, in our faithful service to God if we want to enter into that rest that God has today for His people. Uh, chapter 3, verses 12 to 19 uh, I just want to look at the at maybe verses 12 through 15 here to begin with. When he says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence, confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. So, again, going back 
to that time when Israel had rebelled against God, would not listen to God, and became disobedient to Him. And so he says, in other things, number one, begins with that, beware, brethren. So who's he warning here? He's warning us. He's warning the church. He's warning us. He says, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. You know, you don't, you don't want to have a heart like Israel did, where they were going astray in their hearts. But we want to make sure that we don't have that type of evil heart of unbelief that would lead into departing from God. And that's just the whole thing. Here's a process that people would go through. Now, if you're not careful, you have an evil heart, and that evil heart is because of unbelief. Now, I don't think there's any of us that would ever say here, I don't believe God. But yet, sometimes we act in ways as if we don't believe because something that God tells us to do, we don't do. And sometimes when God tells us don't do it, and we do it. And so uh, that's because of unbelief. We don't really believe God when He says this. We don't believe when God says, listen, if you do this, here's the consequence of it. We don't believe that. And He goes on as He talks about that because of that, he says, we need to exhort one another daily. Uh, do you ever think about how we need to encourage each other daily in our lives? And the reason why we need to do that is because it can happen to any one of us. Uh, we, we need that encouragement lest we have a heart of unbelief, an evil heart that would cause us to depart from the living God. And so we've got to be careful in our lives how we're doing and do what we can to encourage and help one another. So he says, you do that daily while it is called today. Well, if you do it daily, what does that mean? Every day. And you do that while it's called today. I can't encourage you tomorrow. I can only encourage you today. And so while it's called today, I need to be involved in that and trying to encourage everyone that I can. We all need to do that to encourage one another uh, while it's called today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Okay, our time's gone. We've talked about this before. Well, Lord willing, next week, we want to begin at this point and talk about this idea of the deceitfulness of sin and how uh, insidious sin is and how it, it has that power to deceive people. Uh, and it's when people are deceived uh, that they will be led into sin and do things that they ought not to do. So let's keep that in mind and think about that for next week about the deceitfulness of sin. And we'll offer at least three different ways in which it, it is deceitful. Uh, and then notice also next week the conditions that we have to meet in order to remain uh, faithful in service to God. All right, let's have a word of prayer as we close out this. Well, is that the correct time? It's showing 15 after, but it doesn't say 15 after 6. It says 15 after 2. So is that correct, though? It is 15 after, All right, it's 15 after 6. I got looking at that, and I thought... That whole clock may be wrong. It may be 15 till, and I'm trying to end it. Okay. All right, let's have a word of prayer then. Father, we appreciate so much all that you do for us in life. We're so grateful and thankful, Father, for our brothers and sisters in Christ and for the encouragement that we can and do receive from them. And we pray, Father, that we in turn will do what we can to encourage and help them. And we have opportunities provided every day where people need encouragement and help. And we think now about these families who've lost loved ones, we think about those, Father, who are suffering illnesses that are of a life-threatening nature who need encouragement and help us to do what we can to provide that for them. Please keep us in your care as we're dismissed. And, Father, please bring us back uh, this coming Wednesday uh, that we might be together once again to study your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.